Hi there and welcome to another message. This morning we're going to be talking about prayer because almost everybody on the planet prays in one fashion or another. So we have to ask ourselves first of all, what is prayer? How do you pray? Um, what's involved in it, meaning there's so many different religions out there. How do you pray? Do you just is it just talking with God? Um, which God? I mean, remember, there's so many religions out there. How does God hear a prayer and how does He answer prayer? Well, if you are a Bible believer, which I am, Jesus actually lined up in the book of Matthew chapter 6. He gave us a model of how to pray because his own apostles asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. So let's learn from Jesus himself how to pray to the Heavenly Father, God. First of all, in the book of James, now James was written by the half-brother, if you will, of Jesus. He lived with him uh, for just about all of his life. Um, James knew Jesus. He saw him growing up as a child. He saw him entering his ministry. And he was uh, the one who wrote the book of James. And in the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 16, James says this, The prayer of a righteous person is availeth much, is what it says in the King James Version. But what that means is the prayer of a righteous person, man or woman, is powerful and effective. Well, the prayer of a righteous person, that's, see, that's where the beginning of all this message has to take place. Righteous means, well, the Bible says a little further down in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, first thing you need to do is seek the kingdom of heaven, which is where God lives, and his righteousness. Now, how do you get God's righteousness? I've covered this in another message, but it, it bears uh, repeating. The righteousness of God is, is uh, given to you in exchange for your sins. And the only one who can forgive you of your sins is Jesus. Therefore, to obtain the righteousness of God so that he can see you as clean, sinless and righteous is that you need to ask his son Jesus to save your soul and forgive you of all of your sins past present and future then you will obtain what Jesus says basically is I went to the cross died for you and your sins and I want to give you my cloak of righteousness that you can put over yourself so that when you pray my father which is in heaven can see you as a righteous person because your sins are forgiven and you are now clothed or cloaked in the righteousness of Christ. That's what he exchanged for you and for me on the cross. So the first thing you have to do according to James is the prayer of a righteous, so let's put it in proper context and perspective, the prayer of someone who has accepted the Lord as their Savior, that is powerful. That is effective. So now, knowing that God actually will not hear the prayer of a person who is not righteous, which means not saved, which means still living in your sins, uh, the Bible says, and I'll show you at the end, where it says that if you regard sin in your heart, God will not hear that prayer. So we don't want to waste a prayer, but we do want to talk about it. What is it? How do we pray? Why do we pray? And what can we expect as a result of that prayer? So let me get into Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 5 through 15, which is Jesus speaking to his apostles and to a great multitude, actually, who asked him, how do we pray? Well, Jesus says this, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites do. He was referring to the leaders then of the Jewish temple, the Pharisees, who would go around in their Pharisaical robes, clutched like, you know, oh, look how good I am. He says, don't do like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the square, standing in the streets, 
standing in front of the temple and praying loud prayers up to God like, look at me, ah, look at how wonderful I am, look at how I am saying all these eloquent words to God, look at this, he, Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites standing on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. What Jesus meant by that is if you pray, and some people do this in church, and I've heard it and I've seen it. They want to be the most eloquent prayer warrior in the church. So they'll stand up and they'll puff at God. That's what the best I thing I can say. They just puff. I'm going to give the most eloquent prayer that you've ever heard. And their eyes are open generally, and they're just... They want people to notice how smart, how eloquent they are. Well, God says, uh, truly, they have already received their reward because they're looking for a pat on the back from everybody around them, like the Pharisees. Don't do that. The next verse says, when you do pray, <clears throat> go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, meaning He's in heaven, you're in your prayer closet, is what... Uh, the King James calls it. So find yourself a little quiet place in your home, a prayer room, and behind me on the monitor now, I'm showing you what my prayer room looks like. It's where I sing my songs and everything else. But I just kneel at my chair and I pray to God. All that prayer is, is communication because the Lord wants you to have a dialogue. He wants you to have a relationship with Him as you would with anybody in your house, spouse, children, whatever, it has to be a two-way communication. You speak to God through words, and you don't even have to open your mouth. You can say the things in your head, and that's okay, and most of the time I do it that way, because sometimes when I pray aloud, and I'm by myself with God, and I've done it, um, all of a sudden, the old devil can hear that out loud. <clears throat> and uh, if I was praying for, you know, Lord, let, uh, let me sell this house or whatever it is, five minutes later, the phone would ring and, oh, there's somebody, look, it's an answer from God. And they would see the house and I'd never hear from them again. So I have learned when you pray, pray in secret, in secret, in secret so that God can... Um, reward you openly, and he says that uh, in the very next verse. So, see, you do learn things along the way, and when I learn them, because I have the white hair to prove I've been around for a while, and I've lived uh, a good portion of life, and I've lived a good portion of life in this word, and a good portion out of that word, believe me, I'm no saint. Uh, any more than you are, but I have learned to come to recognize that with God, He really wants to develop this relationship that's two-way between you and Him, between me and Him. And uh, the best way to do that is through prayer. He answers back through His Word, either get in the Bible and understand what He's trying to tell you, and He really does open your eyes, and you can see where he'll answer prayers right through his word. And you get it. You say, oh, now I, now, thank you, I get it. <clears throat> or somebody will say something, a TV preacher or whatever, or a friend of yours who maybe uh, goes to the same church will say, you know, I've been thinking about this. What do you think about that? And all of a sudden, it's an answer to the prayer that you just prayed. So let me keep reading. So when you pray, go into your prayer room and talk to God that way. Then, it says, next verse, your Father who sees what is done in secret. In other words, I'm talking to God, but not out loud. <clears throat> uh, when the Father who sees what is done in secret, He will reward you openly. So, He hears you, He understands your prayer, if you're a righteous person, and then He will answer your prayer, and he will reward, that's what that means, he will reward you. In other words, he'll hear it, and he'll honor that prayer, and give you the answer to that openly, so that you do understand it when he does answer your prayer. For me, most of the time, I understand God, 
uh, has answered a prayer when he actually does it. And that's a confidence builder for me. When I asked one time, and I, I've said this before in one of my messages, I needed a roof on my tenant's house down the front. You know, I'm in the studio here, of course, but down the front uh, of my property, there is another house that the tenant owns, and I needed a roof, didn't have the money at the time. Um, so that hurricane of that year came by. It was the only roof in the town where every shingle on it blew off 500 feet down the street. The insurance company came out that week, and they replaced the roof, didn't cost me a nickel. So God does answer prayer. How did I know? The roof was gone, and there was the insurance company, and there's a new roof. I didn't pay five cents. Somebody got mad at me, as I said before, and said, Well, yeah, so God created a hurricane just for you and your roof, right? Yeah, right. Actually, yeah. Hey, I'm not saying he created it just for that reason, but certainly as a result of that hurricane that it created, usually um, things like hurricanes, tsunamis, and so forth, I've said this before, he does that to get your attention because without a crisis, nobody seems to fall on their knees and, and go and seek out God. But with a crisis, first thing on Sunday morning, everybody's in church, like the 9-11 incident, and churches were full that weekend. So things like that, unfortunately, drive people toward God. Uh, he continues on in Matthew chapter 6 and says, When you do pray, don't keep babbling like the pagans do. Uh, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Now, I'm reminded of a whole bunch of uh, religions that I see that they might have beads, and I'm not picking on Catholics or Hindus or anything, or Muslims or any of that kind of stuff, but they all do that, and they repeat prayer after prayer after prayer, and they repeat, and they hit the beads, and they repeat. And But this is saying, when you do pray, don't keep babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So what that means to me is, for example, if I wanted to talk to a spouse or a child or you, I'm not going to sit there and just keep repeating and repeating and repeating and just say, uh, uh, Mary, it's real, been real nice to see you and uh, I hope to see you again. Mary, it's been real nice to see you and I hope to see you again. And Mary, you know, it's been really nice to see you and I hope to see you again. And Mary, Pretty soon, you're walking away. You're not going to listen to it. So God says the same thing. Don't do vain babblings, uh, because I'm not going to listen to it. That's what he's saying. So, next one. Do not be like them. Them who? Them the pagans, those who don't even know me. Uh, don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask it. So, <clears throat> some people say, Gloria, thank you. She keeps reminding me to have a drink in front of me. Right now I'm nursing a cold <clears throat> and I have a wicked sore throat. So I know that's coming, so I'm probably going to have to redo songs and upload different songs that I've already done for the next week or so. Uh, don't know. <clears throat> hope not, but I do hope to get this message done on prayer. Pray for me uh, that I will have a very short cold. Normally they last three to six weeks. So, don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask it. So then you might ask me the same question I asked the good Lord. Well, if you already know what I need, why am I going to waste my time praying for it? And the re answer to that is very simple. God wants to have a dialogue with you. Sure, He knows what you need before you ask it. But He continues to tell us to ask it. Why? Because that gets us either on our knees, or you can pray standing, or you can pray to God driving in your car. Hopefully you're paying attention, you pull over to the side of the road when you decide to do that. But I generally, out of respect, I kneel at my chair in my office, but many times I speak to the good Lord just walking around the house or whatever because I have a relationship, and with that relationship you're constantly in communication and constantly talking, and he's constantly talking back to me through his word, or right through my mind. I don't know how he does it, but
but he does do it. Then Jesus says in Matthew 6, so this, let me give you a model, this is how you should pray. I didn't say it, Jesus said it, so this is where we need to pay attention and listen. So this, my apostle friends, he was saying, and to those of you out there who are listening in my audience, Jesus was saying, this is how you should pray. Begin it by saying, remember the Our Father who art in heaven? This is that prayer. But you got to break the prayer down so that you understand what Jesus is telling you, how to pray, why to pray, and how to get your answers to the prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. Well, in order for you to say, Our Father, what he means by that is you are a joint heir with him, so that God becomes, not only is it God, Jesus' heavenly Father, but, it, but he's your heavenly Father if you are righteous, like his brother James said that I already read to you earlier. So, our Father, which is in heaven. Now, Jesus says over in John 14, 6, there's only one way to get to the Father, which is in heaven, and that is through me. For I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. Therefore, this is more proof that you need to be righteous or saved. You need to know the Lord as your Lord and Savior before God the Father will hear you. So what he's saying is, our Father, which art in heaven, you're acknowledging He's your Father, you're acknowledging you are righteous, you're acknowledging that you became a born-again Christian or follower of Christ, and you can learn all about that by clicking on the link below called the Salvation Link. So he says, Our Father which is in heaven, holy is your name. So he's trying to say, let's acknowledge God first, who he is, the creator of the universe and the earth, and your creator. You're acknowledging how holy and how righteous God is. And sometimes I'm awestruck when I go to pray. It just overwhelms me who it is that I'm in the presence of, and I can be in the presence of that because Jesus' cloak of righteousness is upon me, as it is you if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, which I did at age 11. And uh, holy, think about that, holy. God is holy, he's righteous, he's without sin. And he created you and everything that is on this earth. And the mystery that baffles everybody it says there has to be a beginning. Who created God? Nobody. And let me straighten you out on that right now. The, with God, he says to Moses, you tell, Moses said, who shall I say has sent me to the people of the Israelites to tell them I'm going to be their deliverer? <clears throat> and God said, you tell them I am has sent you. I am, which means I always was. It's hard to get your brain around there was no beginning. It's sort of like a wedding ring, which I don't happen to have. But if you do, take a look at it. Where's the beginning of that ring? Where's the end of that? There is none. It's just, there's no starting point. There's no ending point. And if you think about what eternity is, eternity, say it. Eternity, eternal life. That means you are going to live somewhere, either in Hades, uh, until such time as you're judged, and if you fall short of the glory of God, which means you don't accept His Son as Savior, you'll end up in that lake of fire, 4,000 feet, 4, feet below your feet right now. Uh, and if you do accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you'll end up in heaven, for how long? Eternity. Is there an end to eternity? No. So that's what you can grasp or get your head around, is there is no end, therefore there's no beginning. God always was. He said, I am. So that's how holy God is. And the next verse says in Matthew uh, 6, it says, uh, May your kingdom come, and may your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now you have to figure out, what do you mean by may your kingdom come? Your kingdom is in heaven. How can may your kingdom come 
and your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Well, what is the will of the Father? Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 40 and 39, and this is the will of him who sent me. Therefore, this is the will of the Father, that everybody who sees the Son would believe and therefore would end up in heaven. So that is what he's saying here. May your kingdom come and may your will be done. May everybody who sees or hears about Jesus believes on him and inherits eternal life. May that happen. That's what Jesus is telling us. So that if I give a message like that, that's the goal. To get you pointed to Jesus so that you can end up in heaven. May your kingdom come. May your will be done right here on this earth as it is in heaven. That's the Father's will in heaven is that you and I end up there. Therefore, that's why he introduced his son all throughout the Old and New Testament. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. And Jesus is trying to teach us to ask the Lord for, just provide for me today what I need to pay my bills, put gas in my car, that's your daily bread needs. Um, supply your food, clothing, and shelter, which uh, God points out, that's what he will give you if you first seek the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. That's down here in the same chapter of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 25 and verse 26. And then verse 33 says, because I'm remembering it, that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things, food, clothing, shelter, shall be added unto you. It's a gift from God. He takes care of my daily needs, bills, and bills, and mortgage payment, and gas payment, and a little bit of a surplus every month because I ask him to do that. That's part of this prayer. Give us today. I don't worry about tomorrow. I said this many times, and the Bible tells me, take no thought for tomorrow. Just concern yourself with today through midnight. It takes a lot of stress and pressure off my life. That's why I've said many times I sleep like a baby at night. It's all to do with praying and prayer and uh, seeking God in a relationship, a two-way relationship, talking with God, which is all prayer is. It's, prayer is not gimme, 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 like I pointed out before in another message. God is not cosmic Santa Claus. He just wants a relationship with you and with me. A relationship. Why not? He created you and me. Why would the Creator not want to have a dialogue with us? He gave us His words, millions of them, I guess, in His Bible. And do we get in there and find out what His love letter to mankind says? 95% of Christians actually don't get in the Bible. They rely on what some preacher or rabbi or pastor or priest says to them, or guru, whatever, and they don't get into the Word. If you get into the Word, He'll open your eyes and open your mind and open up your heart to be receptive to what He uh, put down in this owner's manual for life. But do we do it? No. So, let me continue. Give us this day our daily bread. And then He goes on and says, and forgive us our sins. Now, this is a biggie right here. Forgive us our sins. That is to say, now, when Jesus died on the cross, we all know, well, we should by now if you've listened to me long enough, all your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. They're done away with, period. You will get into heaven, period. But you're still going to commit sins every day of your life. You're going to have Satan put thoughts in your head that are not good thoughts, and then you're either going to dwell on those thoughts, and then when you... When you dwell on, the, on bad thoughts and you do something about bad thoughts, that's when it becomes sin, just so you know. Because you're going to get bombarded with a million evil thoughts all day long. Whether you're watching TV, reading a newspaper, looking at an ad, watching a billboard, doesn't matter. There's always sex sells, that's always there. Or just, you know, greed, all that kind of stuff permeates your mind all day long. And so, what he's saying here is, forgive us our sins. And if you go into 1 John 1, uh, 
I mean, John 1, 9, it says, if you ask God to forgive you of your sins, he will do that immediately. And he's already done that on the cross. Don't get me wrong, but you're still going to sin every day. Ask him for forgiveness. If you don't, like I've said in another message, then you're going to have to suffer what's called the consequences of sin. Okay, so forgive us our sins as we should also forgive those who sin against us. Oh, oh, so he won't hear your prayer. Trust me, he will not hear your prayer if you're asking him for forgiveness, but you won't forgive Mary or Joe or whoever it is, a relative or a friend or a sibling or um, a child or a co-worker. If you have harbored unforgiveness in your heart, God won't hear your prayers, so you're just going to bounce those prayers off your ceiling and they become of no effect whatsoever. How do I know that? It says so, and I'll show that to you in just a minute. So, forgive us of our sins as we should also forgive those who sin against us. And, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What he's saying there is, God does not lead you into temptation or sin. What he's saying is, allow it so that we are not tempted by the evil one. That's what that verse means. Who's the evil one? Satan. Satan's going to come around every day of your life and tempt you, as I say, putting evil, which means bad, thoughts into your head through the media, through whatever you're looking at, computer, all that stuff. He's going to put evil thoughts in your head, like he did with Eve. Eve, don't worry, take of that fruit of that tree that God said don't take of. Uh, surely you won't die. You're going to believe me or you're going to believe God. Remember that? I said that in several messages as well. So this is what he's saying here, Jesus himself. Saying pray that God would not allow Satan, the evil one, to... Uh, that when he does plant the evil in your head, that you will have strength enough to say no. That your spirit within you will tell your conscience or your soul within you to tell your body, don't act on that particular sin. I mean, that evil thought. When you act on it, it becomes sin, and then that's where you get into a pickle. And now it says, the next one, four, and he goes back to this forgiving others because he wants to dwell on that for a minute, apparently, in this thing in Matthew called the Lord's Prayer. Four, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Conversely, if you do not forgive others of their sins against you, God, your heavenly Father, will not forgive you. You get it? If you're saved, your sins are forgiven, but if you sin, meaning if you have uh, something against your brother or your sister, as I say, or as God says, then he will not forgive you and you will suffer the consequence of that sin. Now, having hatred against your brother, um, I, you know, that... They aggravate me. They just, they, they, I can't be near that person. They just aggravate me. And you harbor that grudge or that sin against whoever has done you wrong in your mind. If you don't forgive them, you're not going to be forgiven. And one of the consequences of the sin of having anger or hatred against your brother, your sister, whomever, is that you become bitter. And bitter people are miserable people. And bitter people are negative people. And bitter people have problems um, where they almost need pills to take care of this anxiety. And they wonder why they're depressed all the time. Well, it's a consequence of disobeying this part of the Lord's Prayer. Plain and simple. Let me continue. For if you do not forgive others their sins, like it says, your Father will not forgive your sins. So you're going to be stuck with those consequences. Now, here is why God will not hear anyone's prayer who holds a grudge against his brother or his sister. That's found in Matthew 21, uh, Matthew 5, 21 through 24. And Jesus is speaking again, again, and he says, you have heard it said, what that means is, you've heard it, 
out of the Old Testament because that's all they had at the time. So you have heard it said from the scriptures, uh, it was said to the people long ago, which again refers to the scriptures, that you shall not murder anyone because anyone who murders shall be subject to judgment. That is in a court of law or eventually by God himself. But I tell you this, this is Jesus speaking now in the New Testament, that anybody who is angry with his brother or sister or sibling or child or co-worker, anyone who is angry with the brother or sister will be subject to judgment. That is God's judgment. Again, you will have to pay the consequence for being angry and one of those is bitterness. So, again, this is, I'm continuing to read, because this is, is pretty important because nobody understands this verse, not many. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, R-A-C-A, -A, see what I mean? Nobody understands. What does that mean? It means if, if you call somebody a brother or a sister or a co-worker or anything, Raka, that means an empty-headed person or you're a fool or whatever, you're just a moron. If you, In other words, you have this animosity or anger or jealousy or whatever toward that person. It's answerable in the court. What that means in that verse is that if somebody calls somebody a name, bullied them, whatever you want to call it back in the day when the Holy Temple was there, you would have to face the uh, Sanhedrin. That would be the people who were in charge of the Jewish uh, metering out the law then. They would hear that case like Judge Judy and they would hear your argument and then they would decide who gets what, what punishment goes to who. So he says if you call your person, uh, that somebody a name and you bully that person and they come before the Sanhedrin here in the temple, then you will be judged by them. But I say this, anyone who calls their brother a fool will be in danger of hellfire. Wow, that's pretty serious. I mean, I've called people fools. Believe me, what a fool he is. So what did God mean when he says anybody who calls anyone else a fool is in danger of hellfire? It simply means this. That's a serious thing with God. Got to have another sip. Think about it. God is the creator of you and me and them, the ones that we're calling a fool. God said early in Genesis several times, come, let us make man in our image. And here you are calling that person that God made a fool, an empty-headed person, an idiot, a moron, whatever uh, adjective you'd like to use to describe the person that you hate or are angry with, what you're saying is, well, God, I know he's made or she's made in your image, but I say they're a fool. Therefore, what you're really saying is, the one who made them must be a fool too. You getting it yet? I got it a long time ago. So when you're bullying or criticizing others, what you're really saying is to God, you made that person, and I'm angry with that person because of whatever. Rectify it, because God created that person just like He created you. He loves that person. No matter what they've done, God is not willing that any should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance and get to know His Son as Lord and Savior. God said it. I did. So when you choose to pick on somebody that God made, it's the same thing as picking on God Himself, the Maker. So you have to be careful of that and watch that. The next verse in, a verse in Matthew says, Therefore, 5, 21 through 24 that is, Therefore, therefore, in other words, all these verses are there for a reason. That's when I read the word therefore, I always say it is there for, and he's about to explain why the previous verses are there. They're there for you to learn something. So verse 24 of Matthew chapter 5 says this, Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar, in other words, if you're coming to God through prayer, 
and worship. You want to worship Him. Holy is your name. I want to say a prayer now. He says, if, but if you have, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there at the altar when you're praying, before you say a prayer to me, God says, I want you to remember that your brother or sister, if you have something against them or they have something against you, leave that gift, leave that prayer, don't bother praying right now, don't bother worshiping me. He says, go to that person and be reconciled to them, then come back and offer your gift of prayer. Then I will hear you, then I will accept your worship. But if you're harboring, see his whole thing here is about harboring anger against somebody else. Uh, meaning he's more heavily concentrated, or heavily concentrated on this thing with anger against your brother or your sister. Go and reconcile yourself to them, then come pray, then I'll hear your prayer. So here in Matthew 5.24, God is actually referring us back to Genesis 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, when he said to Cain, who slew his brother Abel, Cain, I perceive that you are harboring uh, sin in your heart. Sin crouches at the door of your heart. In other words, God knew that Cain was going to be slaying his brother Abel, and he wanted to give him a chance to reconcile with his brother and a chance to not be punished by God. So he says, I perceive that you are, that sin crouches at the door of your heart, and I think that before I accept your offering, see, many preachers even say, well, God didn't accept Cain's offering because it was vegetables and not meat. No. I've talked about this before, but I'm here to remind you now because we're talking about prayer in Matthew by Jesus, but God's referring you back to Cain and Abel because he said, Cain, this is why I do not accept your offering, because you are harboring sin, anger against your brother in your heart. Go and reconcile that with your brother, then come back, then I will accept your offering. Same thing that he's saying now in Matthew 5.24. I think you're getting the picture. As it turned out, Cain said, no, jealousy was so bad uh, within his heart that Satan put in there that he did go out and kill his brother. So God's trying to prevent you from, and Jesus has said, if you've got anger in your heart against your brother, it's the same thing as if you've committed murder. So, he's, so he weighs that very heavily on, before you pray and ask for anything whatsoever, Make sure that your heart is right. Make sure that you don't have all this sin within your heart and this anger and jealousy and bitterness and everything else going on. Then I will hear your prayer. Okay, how do I know that? Uh, because David, the king of Israel, said this in Psalm 66, 18. He said, if I regard iniquity or sin in my heart, God will not hear me. David's telling us that back in the Old Testament. So if you have sin in your heart, God will not hear you. Go get that cleaned up. Go do the John uh, 1-9 thing. If you ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you and he will then begin to answer your prayer. Uh, and so that's what this whole Lord's Prayer model is all about. That's what I'm trying to get across to you today. Hopefully I have made that done. For God to hear your prayer, you must first acknowledge that He is your Heavenly Father. How do you do that? Through the righteousness of His Son. How do you do that? You need to be saved first. How do you do that? You can click on the link below, the salvation link, and then you'll know all about it. That's the first step toward saying a prayer. Then God will hear you, and that's it. So that's it. Short message today. I'm happy to say, and so are you probably. And I'll see you next week. Don't know what I'm going to be speaking about yet, uh, but I do have a couple of ideas floating around in my head, and unless God changes it, I'll be back to see you next week, and hopefully your prayers for me that this cold and flu, whatever's happening right now with the weather changes, will disappear so that I can sing my songs, which I love to do, and bring another message next week.